I want you to turn tonight, if you will, to the Gospel of John, chapter number 3. The Gospel of John, chapter number 3, as we continue on in our uh, walks with our Lord and His 20 steps from glory to glory. Uh, and we started a couple of weeks ago, well, last week I believe it was, on the techniques of our Lord. And this is the 12th step that we're looking at, many different things in, on each one of these steps. Uh, but the way that our Lord deals and what He does uh, in His techniques that He used uh, during this three and a half years uh, of His earthly ministry here on this earth. Uh, and we are thankful for God giving us His Word and letting us in on how our Lord dealt with things. I, I want to begin reading in chapter number 2 uh, in verse number uh, 23. Uh, and we'll flow right on in into John chapter 3, a very familiar chapter of Scripture, a very familiar portion of Scripture. Uh, but my God, what a powerful portion of Scripture in how that we see uh, the story of mankind that's needed when Jesus deals with one of the most religious and one of the most educated and one of the most uh, religious people uh, in Jerusalem at that time. Uh, but I, rec I call your attention as we'll be reading these verses how it didn't press the Lord one bit. Uh, he knew what he needed and he dealt with the heart problem. And that's the way God always deals with. He deals with the problem that needs to be, the situation that needs to be taken care of and goes from there. But we'll notice as we flow into chapter number 3, it'll help us get a better rendering of it. Verse number 23 of chapter number 2. Now when he was in Jerusalem in the Passover, at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man. I love this phrase, for it fills us in on why Nicodemus came to Jesus. For he knew what was in man. And immediately, one of the greatest chapters in the Word of God, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doeth except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit." Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master, literally the master of Israel, and knoweth not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except that we do, uh, sp we speak that which we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness." If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then he gives a dynamite keg. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth him is on him is not condemned, but he, he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the son, only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And of course here we have the great story 
of Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night and Nicodemus uh, being born, I believe he gets saved at night because of other passages of Scripture in the Gospel of John and because of him uh, coming to take the body of Christ off the cross and, uh, and uh, then taking him to the tomb. Uh, with the other, other witness, and they, I, I believe it's revealed to us that Nicodemus was a saved man after this night. Up until this time, he was a lost man, very religious, but lost. He was a knowledgeable man, but lost. And so Jesus uses one of his great techniques here uh, to deal with the lost person and to talk to a lost person. And so as we see uh, this uh, particular uh, portion of Scripture tonight, as we look at our Lord's techniques, uh, we come now to not only the interruption techniques where we looked at last time in chapter 2 of John, uh, where uh, that Jesus went into the temple and interrupted the money changers. And of course, uh, he showed righteous indignation. Uh, he got angry, but he sinned not. And we see his techniques there for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of reverence, and for the sake of restoration. Moves right on into the next chapter. Uh, after telling us that uh, he kn knows what's in man's heart, we see the interaction technique here. Uh, here we see that he dis Jesus discusses the essential theme uh, of man's need. Uh, he comes right on the scene as he starts his ministry out. And here this interaction technique, this chapter has, of course, uh, been given to us and has been loved by the saints of God in every church era since it was written and since it was sent to the church uh, in this Gospel of John. It's probably uh, best known for this paramount text that I read to you tonight. Twenty-five short words, each one of them packed with dynamite, with the sun being the thirteenth word in that verse of scripture, John 3, 16, showing us that he's the balanced word or he bounces everything out. Twelve words before, twelve after. Uh, and this text has been tried to be an exalted, but it's no way that you can exhaust it. There's no way that you can preach its un unlimited resources that it has in a lifetime of preaching. Uh, it's embedded in the middle of this chapter, showing us why Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. How does man get saved? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the only one that can save you. And so there's an interaction that's going on here as we see this tremendous text that is before us. Uh, yet the con conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus has become the conversation of ages. Uh, what preacher has not preached his heart out on this passage of Scripture? What witness has not witnessed his heart out on this passage of Scripture? How many people have witnessed for the glory of God and tried to lead people to God and goes to this very passage of Scripture and uses these words that's intertwined throughout this chapter to show us man's greatest need, that Jesus says ye must be born again. And so we see here his interaction in this particular phase of his life when he's going out concerning Nicodemus and a very religious man. And so another one of the ways of God is set forth in this interaction of our Savior. Remember last time we introduced you to this section by telling you, as Isaiah says, uh, Jesus, God says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than yours and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so we see again operated here. Nicodemus, this religious man, had a way of salvation, but God knocked, that, uh, knocked him off his horse with that. Uh, he didn't even pay any attention to what Nicodemus knew. He didn't pay any attention to how Nicodemus was trying to butter him up or trying to talk to him or trying to tell him how much that he knew and what have you. Jesus went right to the heart of the matter, right to the core of the matter. And you see, the interaction is seen here concerning Jesus Christ, his greatest need, uh, showing man's greatest need. And that's that little phrase, ye must be born again. And so this little phrase, uh, a master in Israel, in verse uh, number 10 of, of John chapter 3, can be rendered uh, in the Greek language, I'm told, uh, as the master in Israel. It's believed that Nicodemus was the most popular teacher in Jerusalem. It was believed that he was one of the most learned men in Jerusalem. It is believed that he was a man uh, that was well versed in Scripture. Jesus answered and said unto him in verse 10, Art thou literally the master of Israel? In other words, the ringleader. 
You're the one that, that's educated. You're the one that's teaching the Torah, the law, the Decalogue, the five books of Moses. You know the Psalms. You know the Scripture as it's written. And you proclaimed it. And you're a teacher in the synagogue. And you're a teacher in the temple. And you don't know these things? Uh, of course, Jesus is coming and he's knocking a whole lot of men off of that horse, so to speak. Uh, Jesus is coming in an era when he's letting people know that he's the answer uh, to man's problem. He's coming to the era letting them know that he is the Messiah, that he is the promised son. He's the promised one. He's the promised prophet. He's the one that God had promised in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that he would come. He would be the savior of mankind. And he spends three and a half years delivering parables or stories, a heavenly story with an earthly meaning, or a earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and delivering his heart out to different people, performing miracles where he went. We know at least 35, but I believe, as I told you many times, he done many, many more miracles than that. He didn't do the first miracle till he was 30 years old. Uh, there in John chapter 2, because we are told now, this being the first miracle that he did. Uh, 35 more, uh, 34 more are uh, recorded after that great miracle of turning the water into wine and what tremendous miracles they are. Uh, dealing with man's need and dealing with the greatest need of mankind and that's to be born into the family of God. And so now Jesus has an interaction technique that he begins to do it and that's a discussion that goes on. I read these scriptures to you tonight and that was a discussion that went on between Nicodemus and God himself, Jesus Christ being God. Nicodemus, the religious man, and God, the righteous man. Here, there's a discussion that goes on. And Jesus interacts here and begins to lay his heart bare and to tell him why he's come. Uh, and so the most popular teacher in Israel did not realize what Jesus was here for. Yet from all indication, this teacher still needed to be taught. This great teacher of Israel needed to be taught some things. He needed to know what real true salvation was all about. It had man's, man, uh, man's need was really all about. He not only came to Jesus, but thank God he did acknowledge that Jesus was a master. Did acknowledge that he was a great teacher. Look at verse 2 of our chapter. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Uh, so he has no, that question, that, it's no question about it. He knows that he's the rabbi. He knows he's the master of Israel. He knows that he's a great teacher come from God. Uh, but one thing that he did not grasp and did not have a comprehension of that time, he didn't really know. He knew that he was a teacher come from God, but he didn't know he was God come to teach. And so here's God coming uh, with a message and telling him that he needs to be born again. I'm glad that Nicodemus, and we'll see it in just a moment, uh, that he didn't get puffed up and mad and get religious on Jesus. I'm glad, thank God, that he did ask the question, had sense enough to know, how can? He didn't say why. He said how. And so there's a big difference. He didn't question him, why should, why should I, a religious leader, why should I, a man of high caliber, why should I, a ringleader of the Sandy, why should I uh, need such things as you were telling about? He didn't say why. No, 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 no. He said how. How can this be? How can a man be born he was old? Can it any second time into his mother's womb and be born? And of course we know that's ridiculous. That can't happen. And so immediately he gets his attention. Immediately the wheels are turning. Immediately Jesus goes to the spiritual aspect of it. Goes to the interaction of man and goes to what Nicodemus really needs and has to get him to thinking. You will not get saved until you think. You will not get saved until you realize you need to be saved. You, you, you will not get saved until you say, hey, I need this help. I need this man. I, I can't help myself. I need to know how this is done. Uh, I, I, I've had people to ask me over the years, what do you mean am I saved? Well, that's the same thing as Nicodemus said. How can a man be born when he's old? That's the thing. What, what do you mean? What, what is this thing of being saved? And then, of course, that opens the door. And you go in there and you go back and relate why that man needs a Savior and why the Jesus came to this world and why the phrase, ye must be born again. What does it mean to be born again? And, of course, that's an open door that you can go and you can witness to people and tell them that you have to be born of God and born of the Spirit. And it's a spiritual matter that, that God takes this man and turns it around. And the inside operation that God comes in 
again and helps you to walk with Him and talk with Him and you become a new creature in Christ. You can't do it yourself, but God does that. That's the reason He came. That's what He's talking about by being born again. What factors are in this? What's He talking about concerning this? And so our Lord's technique is getting all eyes on Him because He's the only Savior. And let's get the conversation focused on Jesus. We, we know you're a master. We know you're a great teacher, Nicodemus. We know how much you know. We know you're a very knowledgeable man. We, we know that you've got your goods together. But let's talk about the thing that's really needed here. Your education is not going to get you to God. What you know is not going to get you to God. You're going to have to go by way of the cross. We don't see that in John chapter 3, do we? Yes, we do. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so he goes there to this thing of being born again. He deals with the spirit blow of where it listed. He goes with the whole operation of being born again. He goes with his technique of realizing that man cannot be saved apart from the Spirit of God hovering over him, convicting him, and opening his eyes and drawing him. So he knocks all of the works out of it and says you must be born again by believing. The word believe and believing pops up over and over and over throughout this entire gospel of John and in the salvation aspect of this. Because you cannot be saved apart from believing. Not what you believe, it's who you believe. And you believe Jesus Christ and believe that Jesus Christ is God and you believe that he's the one that gets the job done. And so he not only came to Jesus, but he acknowledged that Jesus was a teacher come from God. Immediately, the teacher of all teachers addresses the teacher, Nicodemus, concerning the missing essential in his life. How many times... Have I preached to people? How many times have you witnessed to people? They claim to be religious and claim to be saved. They probably are very religious. And they claim this and claim that. But they are missing the essential ingredients of being saved by the grace of God. They are missing Jesus Christ. They, they are missing having a repentant heart. They are missing the real, real meaning of what it means to be saved and the essential things in their life. Three times Jesus emphatically stresses the definite necessity of being born again. Look at verse number three. In verse number three, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse number five. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 7. Marvel not, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. And so that's emphatic. That is a necessity. That is, it cannot happen. You can't even see the kingdom of God. Much less enter into the kingdom of God unless you had the new birth. Unless you've been born again. Unless you've been moved by, by the Spirit of God and convicted by God and drawn unto Him and been birthed into the family of God. And so Jesus discusses the essential theme of you must be born again. There's a word that keeps coming up that's caught my attention. Of course, many more times it's mentioned in the Word of God. But there's at least five different essential must. That is a necessity for every believer. The first one is you must be born again in verse Verse number seven. Everything else follows that. Marvel not, I said unto thee, ye must be born again. That's the first essential of you being saved. You got to be born again. After you're born again, there comes another must. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In verse number 14 of chapter number 3. That's the second essential. You cannot be born again apart from the sacrifice. The sacrifice is Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sin and the world's sin and for my sin. And so that sacrifice that we look at has to do, and the sacrifice in the Word of God is a blood sacrifice. No man coming to God apart from Jesus Christ. And when you come to Jesus Christ, you've come by the way of the cross. I've said this I don't know how many times in my preaching and we'll continue to say it because it's so. There's level ground at the foot of the cross. The cross makes all the difference in the world. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my sin rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. The cross to the world is foolishness but unto us that are saved it is the power of God. The cross is the only thing that can take care of your sins. Oh, not the cross itself, not the wood, no, 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 but the work of the cross, the person on the cross, Jesus Christ, as Moses was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, why was that? What was that? 
that. That was a picture of Jesus Christ dying for sin of man. What was the criteria in Numbers 21 for that crowd? All they had to do, and that again shows us salvation has always been without works on our part. Salvation is a work of God, not a work of man. And so therefore, as he lifted him up on that cross, and when they said, all he said, look and live, look and live. If you don't look, and the look meant that you looked upon him. You looked upon the brazen serpent. Brass in scripture represents judgment. And the Christ of Calvary took our judgment and the judgment of mankind. Even back in Numbers 21, there was a picture of Jesus Christ dying on that cross for man's sin. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. I want to say it again because I want to get it embedded in your heart. I never want you to lose sight of this and I never want you to go in a different direction. I want to tell you that Jesus Christ did not become a sinner. He became sin. Jesus Christ Christ didn't become a sinner. No, 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 no. He became sin for us who knew no sin. And so when they looked at that brazen serpent, it represented the symbol of sin. And it was symbolic of sin. And so they looked upon him. When we look to Calvary and we look to Jesus, the author and finishing, the completer of our faith, thank God we're looking to him that took our sin upon himself and has saved our miserable soul. Therefore, going back to you must be born again. I'm born again again because there is a womb experience, a womb experience. Thank God Jesus Christ in the virgin wombs, Mary. Thank God was born over 2,000 years ago of a virgin, came into this world and had God's blood in him. That was God's blood that he shed, not man's blood, but God's blood. And so the cleansing power of the blood, as Jesus had that womb experience, the only kind that's ever been like and the only kind ever will be, never be another one like it. And then there uh, was, was that day that Jesus Christ uh, showed us that he had that a uh, wound experience. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. We have had the chastisement of our peace uh, was laid upon him. Jesus Christ took all of our hell, took all of our sin, took everything for us. That's the technique Jesus is using now. And when he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so much the Son of Man be lifted up. Look and live, my brother. Look and live. Thank God I'm glad tonight that the only thing I can do without any works concern concerning salvation is to just believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and that he'll do what he says he would do. I've been birthed into the family of God tonight. Been born again by the Spirit of God tonight because of the work of Calvary and because of that. Verse number 8 tells me not only is it a womb experience and a wound experience but because of that wind experience. You will notice in verse number 8 it says the wind blow it where it listeth and thou heareth the sound thereof but Canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. That word listeth there means as it desireth, as it wills, as it please. You will never be saved apart from the work of the Holy Ghost in your heart and the revealing of the Holy Spirit revealing uh, God to you who Jesus Christ really is. Thank God for that day that He convicted me. He drew me, opened my eyes and saved my miserable soul. So that's the conversation that's going on even 2,000 plus years ago where the most religious man on the face of this earth was told Nicodemus you must be born again your works won't get it your education won't get it your will won't get it it has to be the will of the father the wind of the spirit and it has to be the work of the son it is the work that I've done that's the reason I've come to this world to seek and to save that which was lost that's the reason I'm here Nicodemus to do a work in your heart and to save your miserable soul. You can go back to the house tonight saying I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. I've been redeemed by the precious blood of the lamb because of the work that he's done. Yes, that's God's technique. That's the technique he had back then as he had that conversation and discussed the essential things uh, with Nicodemus. It's still his technique in our day over 2,000 years later that he, thank God, gives us his word and tells us we must be birthed into the family 
of God. I'm glad he made that step. I'm glad that he went to where Nicodemus was. I'm glad, thank God, Nicodemus came to where he was. I'm glad, thank God, for the word that was shared. And thank God for the conversation that took place and the technique that took place over 2,000 years ago. His technique is still working tonight. It is Jesus plus nothing, man is nothing. What a great God we have. What a great step he made. What a great thing that he done. I think you'll agree with me that first must is you must be born again. That second must is you must realize if you are born again that it's a sacrificial work of Jesus Christ and what he's done, verse 14, that gets it done. So as Moses lifted up uh, the, uh, the serpent in the wilderness, here's that word again, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he's going to be a little while later lifted up on that cross. Paul says this thing was not done in a corner. This thing was not done in a head place. This thing was done as a lifted up God and a lifted up son that the whole world could see that there's the Savior. There's the one that whosoever will can look upon and cry upon with a repentant heart believing in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead. That he's the son of God. That he's who he said he would. Thank God if you'll look you can live. If you'll by faith take him thank God he'll save you. If you'll come to him that was his technique then and is his technique now. Thank God for the Lord's technique here on this earth as he started out his ministry. And so here we find that he, we must be uh, born again. He must be lifted up. The third must is found in verse 30. And once you've been saved by the grace of God, and once you've been birthed into the family of God, you'll have no problem using this must. He must increase, but I must decrease. Thank God that's a humbling experience that we humble ourselves before God and give Him the high experience. He's high and lifted up and we humble ourselves before Him. I don't know of anybody that's genuinely saved that does not humble themselves before Him and says, I am what I am by the grace of God. I must lift up Him. He must increase and I must decrease. And the further I get away from this world, closer I get to Him, the bigger He becomes to me and the smaller I become. That's the whole thing, the whole concept, and the whole technique of walking with God and looking to Him as our blessed Lord. And then in verse number four, in chapter uh, number four, He must needs go through Samaria. Once we go through, once we've been lifted up, once we have looked to Him, once we've humbled ourselves before God, we want others. That's a salvation story in that chapter. He went through Samaria because there was one that was lost and undone. You've heard the story of the Good Samaritan. Well, chapter 4 of John tells us the story of the Bad Samaritan. Here's one that he goes through. And it, I'd, I'd have been in reverse order if I'd been doing this. But Jesus' ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. I'd have went to Nicodemus in the daytime. Or I'd have had Nicodemus come to me in the daytime where everybody could have seen it. I'd have went to this woman at light, in the nighttime where nobody could have seen it. But she, when he came, there's Nicodemus. Nicodemus coming at night, and here's the woman coming at night in the daytime. But Jesus has nothing to hide. And no matter who you are and how bad you are, thanks be unto God, he's got to answer. He's the well of salvation, and he'll give you what you need. That's his techniques of telling you. If you know who you was talking to, you'd say, give me this water. <laughs> You'll never thirst again. Hey, give me this water. Give me a drink of this. Well, hallelujah, I think I will. That's some good stuff. But I want to tell you something. I thirst again. Sunday morning, I want some more. Well, I want some more before then. But when I'm in this pulpit preaching, thank God for the good water. That, 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 that soothes it for just a little bit. But you want some more because it doesn't quench it for good. But that spiritual water, that everlasting water, that everlasting life, I've never hungered for eternal life since the day that God saved me. I hung and thirst for righteousness. I want to do good and have a desire to do right, but thank God He has sealed my salvation, and He has quenched my salvation, and He has quenched that thirst for salvation. Oh, drank of this water. She did give it to me. She got so excited, she left her water pots. That's what she was doing. She come and get some water, but she left them. She, you read the story there in chapter 4, it tells you that's a whole picture of salvation in that chapter. Boy, she got so she said, come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. And they said, boy, I tell you, and because of her testimony, because of what she said, many believed that day. I'm glad, thank God, once we have been saved by the grace of God, birthed into the family of God, that first must, because of that second must of salvation, of sacrifice on the cross, and then because of that, we, in, we decrease in ourselves, He increases in our sight, and we have a must to go through to the world to tell others about Jesus Christ. But then verse 4, in verse 24, chapter 4 and verse 24, 
You look at that one. Praise God. That puts the icing on the cake once we've been birthed into the family of God. In verse number 24 of John chapter 4, it says these words, God is a spirit and they that worship him, hears our word, must worship him in spirit and truth. You cannot worship God apart from the spirit of God. You cannot worship God unless you've been birthed into the family of God. You cannot worship God unless you were saved. That's a technique that God has. That's not changed. It never will change. We come to Jesus because we are in darkness. We come to Jesus because we are blind by this God of this world. We come to Jesus because we're dead and in our sins. But thank God he opens up our heart, opens up to light, births us into his family, and gives us that eternal life because of the sacrificial work that was done on Calvary. And because of that, we decrease in our day and in our sight every day. And he increases and gets bigger and bigger. And we want to work to know he's the great God that saves. The vine revelation of Christ's death on the cross reveals to us that the death was planned in eternity. It was prophesied on earth and it was promised by Jesus Christ. And so his techniques are very good. Uh, so we see the first technique that he has. Jesus discusses the essential themes. You must be born again. That's the essential theme of him coming to be saved, for, to birth you into the family of God. But then he declares experiential truths. You will notice here in verse number four, being confronted with the doctrine of the new birth, Nicodemus blindly says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born in verse number four? And so at this point in the conversation, Jesus took what the ruler understood. Nicodemus understood a little. He didn't understand a whole lot. So Jesus took what he did understand and built upon it. And he began to tell him what he really need and tells him what he, what he has to do to get to heaven. And so he begins to explain the spiritual and experiential concept of regeneration. For it says, that which is born in verse 6, of the, of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Basically, the lesson is this, as a spirit, physical birth produces physical life, you had nothing to do with that. Let me ask you a question. How many of you sitting here tonight in this congregation had one thing to do with your birth into your family? You didn't, did you? You didn't have one thing to do with it. Why do you think that the Lord compared the spiritual birth to the physical birth? You don't have one thing to do. This is what hangs me, but I'm going to say it's the truth. You don't have one thing to do with your spiritual birth as far as your works are involved. The only thing you can do without doing anything is when you hear the Word of God, and you don't get saved apart from the Word of God. When you hear the Word of God, you believe Him. What happened to old Nick here? Nick was troubled. Why did he go to Jesus by night? This is my theory. I believe he went to Jesus Christ because he thought he was going to die before the morning. I, I, I believe he went to Jesus Christ by night because that's when his heart was troubled. We do know he had heart trouble. We do know that he was troubled in his heart because Jesus didn't beat around the bush. He got right to the heart of the matter. He's not only face to face with Christ. He's heart to heart with Christ. And so he sees heart to heart with Christ. Jesus said, the heart of the matter is, you must be born again. Nicodemus is inquisitive now. Nicodemus is, he said, now how can this be? How can a man be born again? He's reasoning from the natural man's reasoning. And see, you can't get to God reasoning the natural man's way. Because the spiritual birth is just that. It's spiritual. It's a supernatural birth. And it's a miracle of God. You can't do it. All you can do is just believe what God says and go take him at his word. As a physical birth produces physical life, so the spiritual birth produces spiritual life. And Jesus taught that as there are evidences of the wind in nature, so there are evidences of the Holy Spirit in those who receive his nature. John 6, 44. Look at that verse. Y'all are doing real good. I'm going to let you go in just a minute. Look at verse number 44. Everybody got it? I want you to see it. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about the Holy Ghost. That wind's a picture of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. Verse 44 of John chapter 6. No man, what is that next word? Can. Do you know what that word is? 
That's a word of ability. Actually, he said, no man has the ability in himself. How could he? He's a fallen creature. Ephesians 2 tells us he's a dead creature. Spiritually, I'm talking about. And so, a dead man has no ability in himself, does he? It said, no man can, has the ability in himself. Come to me, but thank God for that except. Except the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Oh, thank God. For the work. And that's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. He said, he's not trying to, to, to get him in a state of confusion. He's not trying to get him to a place where, man, I don't understand this. Nicodemus is asking questions so he can understand. Jesus said, there's a breath of God that comes upon you. There's a wind of the Holy Ghost that convicts you. There's an enlightening experience that opens up your eyes. And because you believe me, I'll give you that light and I turn that light on. And thank God I will save you. But remember, it's all of me, Nicodemus. It's not your education. It's not because you've taught all these years in seminary. It's not because you are from a rich family or a poor family or any other family. It's because that you do not have the ability in and of yourself. And thank God, because of that, I am going to save you. And all you've got to do and all that's required of you is to believe that I'll do what I said I'd do. That's his technique. I'm not touching the surface of this. This, this is some deep territory and deep in the Word of God, this John chapter 3. Oh, God it is. I'm not even beginning to touch the surface of this. But he does reveal to us that's his technique at the time he came to this world and his technique for de- dealing with men and the salvation of mankind. And so he discusses the essential theme and he declares his experiential truth. The experiential truth is declared that salvation is of the Lord and it's a work of the Spirit of God that's done in your heart. I close with one other thing. Jesus not only declared this experiential truth, but Jesus depicted eternal things. I've already alluded to it and said much about it, not much, but a few things about it. But look at verse 14 again before we go to the house. Verse number 14 of chapter number 3. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And why should he be lifted up? Verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Why would he want to give you eternal life? Because you're going to perish away from God. If God don't do that work, and God doesn't, if, and He's come to do the work, it's not that He won't do it. Thank God, you won't believe it. But when He does do that work, and you believe Him, He will save you. It's childlike faith. It's the simplicity of salvation. Paul makes the statement: "I marvel that you are so soon removed from the what? The simplicity." of salvation, the simple part of salvation. So Jesus here takes an Old Testament of all the things he could have used. Where is he pulled from? Who's he talking to? Now don't forget this. He's the master of Israel, Nicodemus. Oh yeah, boy, he's top shelf. He's an educated man. Don't you think he didn't know what Jesus was talking about? That's the reason Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wheel, immediately. No, No telling how many times Nicodemus had taught that in the temple. No telling how many times Nicodemus has used that, uh, uh, that passage of Scripture and talked about uh, how they had to look and to live, and, but he really didn't understand the concept. But Jesus is filling them in. Now his technique is he's revealing to him what it's all about. And so with, he would from, he very familiar with Jesus confronted Nicodemus with the eternal things. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so the depiction was that the new birth could only be possible and the new birth could only be possible and sins could only be forgiven when the curse and the judgment of sin was transferred. Here it comes to a substitution. Nicodemus knew about the atonement thing in the Old Testament. He knew about the substitution principle in the Old Testament. He knew about the whole the Lamb of God. He knew about the turtle doves. He knew about about the pigeons. He knew about the sacrifice, all of that stuff. Nicodemus knew that. So what's Jesus doing? Oh man, he's arousing his appetite. He's getting to him now and talking some stuff that he under 
stands. Because you'll never get saved until you understand you need to be understanding and you need your sins transferred. You need them cleansed. You need them taken care of. And so now the atonement principle is taught here. Believing here in the transferred uh, sin is being talked about. And by believing in Christ the substitute, the life, the eternal life would replace death, eternal death. And so the text was given for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That ought to be thundered from every pulpit. That ought to be preached from every place. That ought to be thundered forth in the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's God's technique. That's the spiritual technique. That's the spiritual way. That's the word of God concerning that. And that's why Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Next week is tonight. No, we'll be in revival next Wednesday night, Jubilee meeting. But the next time we get together on this particular thing, we look at John chapter 4 and we'll look at the intersection technique con- dealing with the forsaken people and dealing with a forbidden person in a forgotten past. My God, what a chapter. We touched on it a little bit tonight, but we'll get into detail a little bit on the next time. Father, we thank you tonight for another opportunity we've had to stand and to brag on our precious Lord. We thank you for your techniques. We thank you for the divine interruptions. But thank God tonight for your interventions. Thank you tonight, Lord, as you come and as you have done a work in our heart. You've saved our miserable soul. We can come to this pulpit and tell others about your technique. It has not changed. Without the word of God, men don't get saved. Without the witness of the Spirit, men don't get saved. Without the work of the Savior, men don't get saved. And I'm thanking you tonight, Lord, that we can tell it to the whole world. 